contain because we are getting a tremendous amount of, of folks to join these, these lecture series this spring semester. And so I really am happy to see many friends, um, family of ours at the School of Architecture, as well as alumni coming in here, as well as our students who obviously this lecture series is, is set up for, but we, we do uh, appreciate everybody that's able to come in. And too, I just want to also, you know, thank, um, thank AIA Fort Lauderdale for all of their support and activities um, in this lecture series. But, you know, we are excited to, to have, and, and many of you know that Professor Lieberman is actually off this semester, but has graciously come in today to to go ahead and introduce our today's lecturer, uh, who is Antoine Picon. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually hand this over to, to Professor Lieberman, Dr. Lieberman. Um, and again, thank you everybody for coming and attending our third lecture series. We look forward to seeing you at the, the upcoming ones as well. Dr. Lieberman. Thank you, Jeff, so much for your introduction um, and for everyone for coordinating this. Uh, welcome everyone to the FAU lecture series today. I am very pleased today to introduce Antoine Picon. I cannot imagine a greater authority to speak on this year's theme, the role of technology in architecture. Antoine Picon is the G. Ware Travelstead Professor of the History of Architecture and Technology and Director of Research at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Trained as an engineer, architect, and historian, Picon works on the history of architecture, architectural and urban technologies from the 18th century to the present on which he has published extensively. Way back in 1998, Picon began to investigate the changes brought to cities and architecture by the development of digital tools and digital culture. Many of his books and articles deal with this question. Picon's latest book, The Materiality of Architecture, out just last month, is an ambitious attempt to interpret architectural evolution in relation to the changing experience of the tangible world and the successive social constructions of the human. It situates the digital in, uh, in architecture within a more global theoretical and historical frame, a much needed perspective on the topic in my opinion. I also count myself as very fortunate to have had the benefit of his insights and counsel as my dissert dissertation advisor at the GSD. Um, please help me welcoming Antoine. And a quick aside, you may please add your uh, questions for Antoine that we will go through at the end into the chat section. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Valda, for this very generous introduction. And it seems you survived having me as one of your advisors, which is always, you know, reassuring. Uh, good. So uh, joke apart, I'm really happy to be uh, to be here with you, even if the here means I'm actually back in, in Europe, I'm actually in Europe. So I'm going to try to share my screen, ask the couple of ritual questions, do you see the slide, blah, 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 and then we'll, we'll get started. Okay, so sharing the screen. Uh, putting, okay, so do you see the slide? Yes, yes. Good. And do you see the changing slide? Good, because once I had, everything can happen on Zoom. So with the rapid development of digital technologies, the most common question is about what will they be able to achieve in the near future? This is especially true when it comes to artificial intelligence and a lot of uh, you know, scholar, professionals, etc. ask what will it be able to do? But I think a more crucial problem has to do with the roles that human we will play in a digitally permeated future. What will be their role in the design process a few decades from now if AI spreads? So to, 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 to take an analogy, you know, for very many, many years, one wondered, you know, what can we do with uh, remote teaching, digital teaching, et cetera. Now with all these Zoom activity, the real question is what should we continue to do in the physical space? So that's a little bit of question like that. There are today that I'd like to address. There are today, of course, raging debates about whether AI is really going to succeed. Some believe that there are limits to what we can achieve with AI. What I will actually 
take as a hypothesis, because it's actually more interesting, is let's assume that, yes, we can have a real artificial intelligence in a not so distant future. Let's assume that this artificial intelligence will become a pervasive reality in design. And let's try to see what kind of question it raises, among others, uh, you know, what will be the place of humans if that happens. We talk a lot today, especially in the humanities and the social sciences, about the importance of being less human-centered, about the need to treat non-humans with a fairness that we usually reserve to humans. But the truth is that we're still very much humans and that we are more than ever preoccupied by questions such as finding and keeping jobs, being able to express ourselves in a creative way, et cetera. Hence again, the question, what about the role of humans? But before that, I'd like to begin by an apparently naive interrogation, which is the following. Why is it that we're so excited about AI? And more generally, why is it that we want to automate not only fabrication, which we've already begun with robots, et cetera, but also large parts of the design process itself? Why are so many people around the world in architecture school, et cetera, trying to probe what can one do with AI? So uh, let me, so this is a first, in a first part, I'd like to reflect a little bit more generally about automation and what it means. So why are we so keen on automating design? The truth could be, that automation is not an entirely rational enterprise. It's actually all the more unavoidable that it is rooted in something else than rational calculation and the quest for efficiency and effectiveness. We believe that automation is something entirely objective. It might be grounded in a more profound, at a more profound level in, this, in our desire in the recognition that there are forces in the world that go far beyond the usual factors that shape our ordinary action and production. How to be plugged into these action was a question that was addressed actually by an artistic and literary movement in the 1930s and 1940s called the Surrealist. And the Surrealist tried to, experiment, to probe that through their practice of what they called automatic writing. So what is the relation between automation and creation? So I'm not going to give you, let me reassure you, a class on surrealism, but the reason I'm mentioning it is because among their members was actually a young intellectual who was later to become one of the major post-war French sociologists, a guy called Pierre Naville. And after the war, this guy uh, became a keen observer of automation in the automobile industry. And he wrote a very strange essay called Towards Social Automatism, in which you find the following quote, which I find interesting. So Naville wrote, I'm not far to believe, despite the violent rejection that it often provokes, that automatism represents an archetype as ancient and radical as our sense of symmetry or cycle, that it touches something intimate in us, a vibrant chord of our creative power, that it has to do with the enchantment, with a will to power, and many other impulses that moves us, starting from our unconscious. So for Naville, automation was ultimately about this pursuit of the archetype. It was an attempt to make nature do by itself through machine harnessing its power, what humans wanted it to do. It appeared as a Promethean quest that could never be fully satisfied by our present of existing technology as sophisticated as it could be, because it possessed a foundational and even mythical character. So envisaged from this perspective, automation corresponds to something far more fundamental than the ambition to improve efficiency. It reveals rather what is the true purpose of our endless quest for efficiency. It has to do with the desire to create something that can rival nature, living beings in particular. Another way to put it would be to, is to say that automation has to do with a desire to animate matter, 
to surround oneself with creatures that seem endowed with something akin with life. The most extreme form of that is, of course, when this life is in some way similar to ours. And this is actually a, a kind of unavoidable tendency of animation. So there are multiple legends and work of fiction that illustrate the enduring character of this theme. Think of Pygmalion, or probably closer to things you've looked at, think of Frankenstein, which is actually a literal attempt to animate. Uh, to animate. And from the start, robots inherited this tradition. Uh, you may have, I hope you've all seen Fritz Long Metropolis and the robot that seems endowed with a kind of diabolical life. So the question of the relation between robots and life has of course known a new development with artificial intelligence and deep learning. And what I want to suggest is it's by the way telling that the evocation of contrary robots and artificial intelligence oscillates between the profoundly non-human character of algorithm and the way human children in particular learn. So what I want to suggest is AI is inseparable actually from a very long history, which is not only a history of the rational attempt we've made to streamline things, but it's also a history of our dreams and desires. So now if we turn to architecture, architecture has both an intimate and complex relation to the notion of animation. And it's actually a certain number of founding myths of architecture have to do with this question. For example, the myth of Amphion, who is supposed to be this Greek guy from the mythology who built the walls of the city of Troy by playing the lute and the stones spontaneously charmed by the music put themselves in place. This is a 17th century engraving in which you can see the stone that put themselves in place. More seriously now, architecture actually tries to animate matter so that it can enter into a dialogue with humans. And this is what ornament used to be about. Remember this notion of dialogue because I will conversation because I will come back to it. As architect, one of the things you're trying to do is actually to make building be able to have a relation with humans. This is what traditional ornament used to be about, but there are other ways to do that. For example, in the Baroque period, you know, the overall composition, uh, movement of the facade, had to do with this quest. And closer to us, even if you take Le Corbusier's work at La Tourette, uh, there is very clearly the desire to make a, an animated composition. So for a very long time, architecture had to do with animation, but an, an animation leaving aside the question of automatism and movement, a kind of immobile animation, if you want. Now, it is striking to observe how what has happened in the past decades or two may be characterized by a dramatic change in the relation between architecture and animation. Animation has become inseparable from the question of automation. And here we find, of course, the arrival of robots. But pushing further, think of the development these days of all kinds of interactive spaces. Here, for example, the Team Lamb Borderless Digital Art Museum in Tokyo. So pushing even further, we may imagine architecture acquiring something like life in an almost literal sense. So what I want to suggest is what is happening today. Again, it's not only about technological evolution. It's a kind of reactivation of powerful mythical forces. AI is not only a rational enterprise. It's something that is linked to desire and poetics. And this might explain why it is so complicated, this issue in architecture. So, so far, what we've seen is mostly automating fabrication. But the next stage may be very well automating design itself, the design process itself. And this is what I'd like to discuss now. So let me warn you, this is the probably the most complicated part of the lecture and then things will become easier. But I'd like actually to discuss a little bit 
big data, what I've called big data, machine learning, and architectural conversation, this idea of dialogue that I've already stressed. So under what condition is the development of artificial intelligence in architecture possible? Under what condition, what do we need so that it can succeed? So very fundamentally, we need to begin with big data so that machines can learn. And a number of designers around the world are exploring what it means concretely. For example, I have a young colleague at Harvard who is actually entering into large data set about urban form, urban morphology, etc. And dissertation are multiplying all around the world around on the subject of machine vision. How do machine then, once equipped with a large database of examples, etc., what do they see? What do they recognize? It's not here. It's an illustration from a dissertation at the Polytechnic of Lausanne. It's not completely convincing so far, so far with all these kind of labyrinthic composition, but it raises a series of new questions. So let's imagine machines have ingested large enough database of types, tectonic details, ornament, et cetera, et cetera. So we may imagine that artificial intelligence program may be able to produce design of their own, but what will they produce? They may be tempted to combine things that we don't combine usually Baroque elements with modernist ones, for, for instance, and there are a number of people who've begun investigating that, these kind of strange collage <clears throat> done with a machine. At this stage, I'd like to probably take two questions, which may be there again naive, but actually are a bit uh, more complex than what it may seem. The first is machine will do, will may design things, but are we able to understand the way they think? It's not only a matter of algorithm, actually. It may be a matter of the way machine read reality. The elements on which the machine may base itself to read buildings may differ eventually from ours. Think already how languages, for example, understand differently colors. You know, it's well known that in Inuit language, you know, the gray is a much correspond to a much wider series of nuance than in English or French. Uh, in between the French construction vocabulary and the English one, there are significant differences. So machines could actually not see the need for having something called wall or ceiling or floor, but combine differently, understand differently reality. And machines see already reality differently. Where we see flows, for example, like in the top, you know, machines tend to see molecule because they can pretty much follow every passerby or vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. To give a similar example, this is another dissertation. This is the understanding of a CD map by a machine, and it differs significantly from the way we see things. This is not the first time that we cannot understand fully what machines do, but this is getting probably more difficult to avoid as a difficulty than before. But then whichever way the machine reasons, should we want the machine by the end to produce things like those we know? Should we impose upon it, you know, even if it doesn't, rec it doesn't have a category called walls or ceiling, should we impose that by the end, what the machine does resemble what we do? Which is, uh, there are two, there are pro and con. Pro, of course, we will be able to recognize what the machine has done and build it. Con, it may actually be an obstacle. It may hamper machines' creativity. So even if the building industry may want actually to standardize the machine output, uh, one may be tempted still to allow the machine to be more creative. And this is where we arrive to the question, what kind of communication do we want to have with machines? How to have a true architectural conversation with it? And this is where I'd like to go back a little bit in the history of the discipline. You may think that architecture is only about designing buildings, but it's actually 
starts as a conversation. It's a conversation already between a client and an architect. What kind of building do you want? For what purpose, etc. So con con it may be, a, it's then a conversation between an architect and another architect or between a professor and a student. This is a plate from a Renaissance treaties, which is supposed to depict the good architect. The good architect is somebody who teaches. So architecture is a dialogue and you may look the buildings seem to participate to the dialogue because architecture is actually a dialogue, uh, not only between humans, but between humans and the built environment, between humans and buildings. So if we want to continue doing architecture, what kind of conversation do we want with machines? And this is not a simple question. Once again, do we want the machine to resemble us at least superficially? or do we allow it to be itself? That's to say a very different form of intelligence than the one we have. So this revolve actually around one of the most profound question in creation, which is the question of otherness. To create, one must allow something foreign to be born inside us. You know, hence the idea, hence very often, you know, creators saying the idea came as if something foreign entered your mind and captured your attention. Uh, a famous French poet, Arthur Rimbaud, had this formula to convey that I is another. So the question of how to allow otherness to enter into the creative process, because if there is no otherness, you're going to repeat what you already know. If you want truly to create, you must allow something that seemed foreign at first to you to be born inside you. And very often architectural conversation is about otherness also. One of the reasons architecture needs dialogue is because it's a way to have otherness. So in other words, how to, to promote uh, you know, a true conversation with machines. Uh, should machine resemble us, at least externally, should they not? Uh, actually, the problem may not be that much only into the sophistication of the algorithm, but the relation we have with the machine. Okay? Let's me move to the next thing, which is the automation and of design and fabrication. So once again, let's do sci-fi. And let's assume that machine will truly be able to do more and more. And you know what? Perhaps replace a large part of what you're doing, guys. So you see where I'm going. You know, what about your jobs? But I'll come to that later. So they will be able to do substantial things. So, of course, you know, right now this is not the case, etc. But, you know, machines can already write articles. So they cannot write books as boring as mine, but as mine, but complicated, but they can write already small text, etc. So we believed for a very long time, and this is still current discourse, that automation would impact only non-sophisticated jobs. But it might not be the case, especially with architecture. And one of the reasons is that architecture is the most formalized of all the arts. It's an art that has been following rules almost since its creation. And you know, for, I hope you're still seeing the five orders of architecture somewhere in your classes, history classes, but you know, history 101, the five orders, the five orders, it's almost something mechanical. You know, the diameter of the column, you know, the Doric, it's eight times the diameters, et cetera. It's like a system and actually you can, put that into a computer and computer can manipulate the five orders. Later, this mechanical aspect of architecture was very present at the end of the 18th century, early 19th century, when Durand, another theorist, tried actually almost to mechanize the design process, not with machines, but by having steps clearly defined that enabled actually to produce, according to what he says, any type of project. Closer to us in the 1960s, 1970s, the British architect Cedric Price had the same ambition in some ways to systematize uh, design, to explore the link between in some ways automation 
and design processes. So we could probably envisage a moment in which machine might become true partners, real players in the design process. So far, we've had only computers, which are in a way super drawing machines. What is interesting is that at the beginning of the story of computers in architecture in the 1960s, 1970s, actually most people believed that computer would not be drawing machines. They would be actually partners. Again, this idea of conversation. This was, for example, the idea of Nicholas Negroponte at MIT, who had founded a group called the Architecture Machine Group, which was a lab in which they tried to explore that idea. And it led uh, them actually to this idea of conversation that actually, so that if you want to design truly with a machine, not using a machine like a kind of super pencil, you've got to be able to talk to it. And that's one of the reasons the architecture machine group began to be interested in machine interface as on this research and later become what we now call the media lab. And the Media Lab actually recentered the reflection from AI to interface. And we see that these questions of conversation are very present. So now to continue, intelligence might not be limited to design proper. And we may imagine, for example, that we will not have stupid robots, but intelligent robots. And so, which means by the way, that speaking of conversation, just like traditional architecture meant not only talking to between architects, but talking to workers, to the labor force on the construction site, you may imagine that we may have to actually talk to a number of non-human forms of intelligence, the machine with whom you design, but the machine that built, and all these machines may have suggestion of their own, et cetera. So you see quite something in terms of debate, et cetera. So let me move on my central question. What about humans? Because guess what? You know, as soon as you automate, it's a product of desire, but the result is usually there are people who may risk to be out of jobs. So what is specifically human? What might remain human in the design process? So that's a complicated question there again. It's all the more complicated that we invent machines so that if we invent machines, there is something in our brain that functions in a partly mechanical way. There again, we might believe this is a recent question, but it's actually a question that obsessed a number of philosophers throughout history. For, among others, uh, this guy, on the left called Denis Diderot was actually uh, one of the major philosopher of the enlightenment who is also the editor of the encyclopedia. And in the encyclopedia, there are a large number of description of machine. And Diderot himself described at length, this is actually one of his longest article is not on religion, philosophy on the, or whatever. It's on this machine, which was actually a loom to weave stockings. And he was fascinated by the complexity of the machine. And he actually took the description as a way to try to understand how our mind that is able to build such a, to imagine and build such a machine functions. So part of ourself resemble partly machines. So, and it may be, you may remember I said, I is another, uh, quoting Rimbaud, that the otherness in ourself is partly linked to part of our self function as a machine. So anyway, what if we resemble machines, then the problem gets in a way worse. What can we bring to the table that is unique to humans and that machine cannot do? So, so far, reassuringly, we have a much more generalist intelligence than the most advanced computer and the path toward the kind of all-purpose brain that we possess, the path leading to an all-purpose artificial intelligence is still a logic, to a large extent to be explored. 
But there again, let's do sci-fi. We got it. We have an all-purpose artificial intelligence and we can apply it to design. So what should we continue to do that machines cannot do? Probably two things. The first is, you know, the, let's be remain a little bit evident. We have an embodied intelligence. We have a form of intelligence, which is relatively different from the, what we've built so far. We have an intelligence, which is not only a matter of wiring in the head, it's inseparable from flesh. It's inseparable from body, from motion, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, our conception of the body have changed considerably throughout the centuries. This is the Renaissance vision of Leonardo. And it's clear, sorry about that, that this is a very different vision from this kind of body uh, that uh, more contrary forms of bodies. But it's clear that so far, one of the real limitation for robots and artificial intelligence is that they are partly disembodied. So now let's move me move to the second point linked to the first. Because we have a body, we have emotion that makes the purely physical and the mental and memory and most of all cognitive function mix in a very similar way, the physical and the cognitive. And what I want to get is it might very well be this mix that produces relevance and also the series of echoes created by the relation between the physical and the mental in each other's bodies and mind might be at the source of what we call meaning, the symbolic. It's telling for me that for a very long time, architecture was interpreted as what happened when buildings were able to connect with us, but it happened through some affinity with our body. For example, you know, one of the way to understand what was an architectural building was to say, you know, when you put moldings, ornament, orders, et cetera, it as if the body, the building acquired something like a face so that it could look at you. A dialogue means that each one of us has a face. And it's quite interesting also that more generally, the symbolic in architecture was for a very long time linked to the connection to the body. So where do I want to get to the following? Probably, I, we may think that at least for a while, I'll come back to that in a moment. What about humans? Humans have still to decide what truly matters to choose among a range of possible solution produced by the machines, what seems the most relevant to humans. Another way to formulate that borrowing to the military vocabulary is to speak of a shift from tactics to strategy. Tactics is conducting battle day after day on the field. Strategy is to know why you're doing that and what is the goal. So I would say the shift is from the how, how you wage battle day after day, combat, to the why, what is the purpose? And what, you, what about humans? Humans are about defining the purpose. This shift has, by the way, already begun to happen with the diffusion of digital tools, with the rise of parametric design in particular. Parametric design may theoretically produce an infinity of solutions. And in the latter case, the real decision making has to do actually with defining what are the questions, again, the why. So architecture, then, this is the more profound that it may seem, because then architecture means that it's no longer a mere production. It's a choice. And a choice is a form of action. To choose is to act. So in some ways, we used to believe that architecture was a production. It may be that architecture is a form of action. I would say that differently by saying the, the machine produces, the human performs. That's to say he or she chooses. The humans make choices, 
that may, by the way, have to do with how the physical and the symbolic are actually co-emergent, which is a little bit what I wanted to suggest. There is no meaning, human meaning, without a relation to our body in a way or another. So the interaction, by the way, between the physical and the symbolic is what makes possible to inhabit. I don't know whether you ever thought about what does it mean to inhabit? To inhabit, so of course, like here, this is a beautiful modernist house in Hawaii, uh, is actually to be able to, to be in a space that tells you partly who you are through this dialogue with the space. Inhabiting is a dialogue with the space that partly defines you and enables you also to understand what architecture is about. So I would say in summary that this might be what humans may have to do in the future, making choices about inhabiting. Inhabiting, which is in a way also always a political question. So what I'm proposing for those few who are theory buff is a kind of return to the phenomenological, but with a difference that it's not in reference to a static conception of what constitutes the human. And in addition, to complicate a bit further, you may have noted by now that I like complicated arguments, but guess what? Reality is complicated. You know, it may be that one day we will have embodied artificial intelligence, which is something uh, we have to be prepared. It may happen. So how much time do I have? I still have 10 minutes. So I should be able to finish on time. So what does it mean? It means that I mentioned politics. Uh, it means that actually conversation, all that, it means that we have actually to rearrange what do we want? What kind of relation do we have with each other, but also with all the machines with which we will have to interact? What kind of society do we want? And this is what condition, you know, in some ways, the future of architecture. Now, let me return to something I left at the beginning. So we're including, by the way, what to make of robots. Should robots be considered as mechanical slaves? Uh, this is actually a picture from a Swedish uh, movie, TV show called Real Humans which revolves around the, you know, what kind of relation between humans and machines that resemble more and more them. But anyway, all these questions are on, maybe on the table one day. Now, I mentioned poetics. Automation is linked with poetics. And I think one of the things you have to understand in architecture, technology is never only about technology. It's about expression. It's about the mythical dimension of architecture. It's about poetics. So one thing to understand, for example, in the 20th century, industrialization was never only about industrializing. It was about plugging into a broader dynamism. It was about, you know, uh, reaching a new poetic condition. So I think one of the questions also, which is related to all that have, I have said, what kind of new poetics do we want in the digital age? And especially should AI become a reality? It's probably too early to say, but something to note is that architects usually, when, they've re when they related to technology and large technological movements like industrialization in the 20th century, have usually played at the margin trying to subvert the core uh, uh, through uh, you know, creative margins. For example, this explains why the dream of a reinvented craftsmanship haunted modernity and industrialization. And it's, by the way, uh, one of the things that fascinated you know, uh, in the 19th century also, what about humans in the 19th century was seen what about the imperfection that the human can bring to the table. A machine makes perfectly uh, inexpressive and perfect things. Humans do things which are imperfect. In one of your history classes, I hope that you will study John Ruskin, who tried to theorize 
the fact that part of the beauty of old buildings may stem from the fact that they're not produced with the precision of the machine because they are humans. And Le Corbusier toward the end of his life had a little bit the same idea when he began to be extremely excited by the irregular formwork on these concrete, saying that the formwork conveyed the presence of the hand of the artisan, of the, of the worker uh, toiling on his construction site, as if architecture needed this kind of imperfection. Where do I want to go? We're going to live in a world in which things are more and more perfect, linked to digital, the multiplication of machines, etc. What if the new poetics had actually to do with recreating imperfection at the fringe, something like glitches? It's interesting, by the way, that a number of artists have begun working on digital glitches. What can you do in the digital world? And architects have also begun. You know, when, when for example, Gramatio and Kohler got a bit tired of producing these perfect walls with robots, at Zurich Polytechnic School, they began to investigate these kind of strange things. Or my young colleague there again, Andrew Witt, trying also to create these strange objects from very carefully crafted algorithm. So all that to say that, you know, we need there again a conversation with machines to know also where we can intervene to bring glitches to these processes. So speaking of conversation, let's, why not imagine that buildings themselves could have something to say and which I mentioned St. Price, which was probably the most advanced architect on that path in the 1970s. And this is the generator project, which is one of the most fascinating architectural, artificial intelligence project ever conceived was not built, of course, because the technology was not completely there and the client balked at the last minute. But just imagine it was supposed to be a leisure center with a building that has an artificial intelligence. So you tell the building, you know, I want to come the weekend with 10 people and we're going to have a seminar and then, you know, some cocktail by the pool, et cetera. And the machine assembled elements for that. But then more interesting, the machine makes suggestion or even may subvert your thing. She deprives you a cocktail and decide that instead you're going to watch a movie. So you see, why not imagine that? So ultimately, um, that will be my last point. Let me reassure you, I'm almost done. Let's jump even further. And let's imagine that, you know, one day machine may be able to get embodied and may be able to say things about inhabiting. And, you know, in some ways, Hollywood movies are already playing that card, you know, like in, in Ex Machina, et cetera, with this uh, artificial creature on the forefront. So in some ways, uh, you know, what is humans becomes then a question that has no definitive answer. That is a constant question. So let me conclude by what is not completely uh, a sophism, but something that I do believe profoundly. What makes us human? It may very well be that what makes us human is actually not to know what it means to be human. To give you an example that always struck me, there is this Greek mythologic figure, Medea. Medea is supposed to be a, a person, you know, she's left by her lover. And because of that, she kills her two children. That's absolutely horrible. And there've been a lot of pictures of Medea killing her children, you know, very dramatic scene, et cetera, et cetera. So Medea is a monster because she's a monster. She's unhuman. What is more unhuman than to kill one's children? But at the same time, Media is escaping nature because the Greeks still believe that, you know, by nature, mothers were supposed to live their, love their children. So media may be both the most unhuman creature in the world and the most human because she's both, you know, such a freak 
that she's not supposed to be human, but at the same time able to escape nature. And because she's not nature, she's necessarily human. So as you see, you can see what does it mean to be human will be always a complex and unanswered question. And I would end by saying that perhaps design is one of the key dimensions through which we ask this question. Design is probably not about making beautiful buildings. It's about, as I said, of course it cannot harm. It's not an incentive to design ugly buildings, but design is about inhabiting and inhabiting is a question. It's never a certitude, it's a question. What does it mean to be humans? And I think artificial intelligence, I jump in science fiction, I think we may very well never be see artificial intelligence as I described it, but it's a good way to ask us, what does it mean to be human and to be designing? What does it mean for you to be young designers? It means actually implicitly asking yourself, what does it mean to be humans? Thank you so much. And let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Antoine. Your very interesting lecture has prompted a number of questions from the audience, um, as well as from some of our faculty. So maybe I'll ask one or two student questions and try to coalesce them a little bit. And then Daniel, if you would like to go ahead and ask your question, perhaps in a more dialogue-like fashion. Um, uh, how about we do that? So a, a kind of uh, a thematic question, which you did bring up, but maybe the students would like you to speak more specifically to it, is um, one which is, can machines be considered creative? And if machines become so creative, do uh, architects of the future or of today just become sort of programmers of the algorithm? So can machine be creative? It's a little bit like the Turing test. You know, let's suppose, for example, you feed into a machine pretty much all the Baroque buildings built between, you know, the 17th and the 18th century. And you have a machine that is sufficiently sophisticated and, and to, to find rules, etc. It will very probably produce relatively decent Baroque churches to a point that it becomes a bit undistinguishable. So what do we call creative? You know, and then if we allow the machine to be truly the, it, itself, that is to say something non-human, it may end up surprising us. So it may not surprise us at all. So I, I would say in short, we don't know, but why not? So second, I don't think precisely humans should become programmers. I think humans should be strategists that think about what does it mean to inhabit? What does it mean to create meaningful space? To, 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 be, to explain a bit more, I think one of the tasks of architect, you know, Renaissance thinker explained that architecture had to protect humans from two things. The first was the gods, because humans were not meant to live with the gods. So they had to be in some ways sheltered from the gods. And the second was nature, because in the middle of nature, humans cannot live for very long. So actually they had to create an arena for human actions. So I think the, and an arena for human actions suggests implicitly that what humans do has a relevance. So I think what architects have to do is actually to use to dialogue with machines so that machine can produce places that have a relevance for humans, which is not the same as programming. Um, Daniel, would you like to go ahead and posit your question because you are one of the practitioners of this digital turn in architecture. So you may have sort of specific back and forth. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very amazing lecture, very, uh, very thought provoking. Uh, so I think uh, everyone can say that uh, we are very happy to, uh, to have you here. So one of my questions is in this kind of line of uh, the way that we are evaluating uh, creative outputs from AIs. Yeah. So um, 
what happens most of the time, yeah, like you're also explaining, if you give like, let's say a machine examples of Baroque architecture, mostly is going to output a sort of result that it's uh, out from Baroque architecture. Yeah? So it's a sort of interpolation that is happening. So let's say that in that instance, we are quite, uh, it's quite easy for us as, uh, as humans to evaluate those results, yeah? Because the domain is quite clearly defined. Uh, but we as humans, we might have issues when it comes to novel solutions that AIs are uh, generating. Uh, for example, if something is too novel, we are going to disregard it, yeah? If it's too close or too familiar, we are also going to disregard that as being creative, yeah? Absolutely. So um, what I'm curious of, and a, a part of my research is also looking in this kind of aspect of perception and trying to see how you can use, in a way, um, uh, AI to challenge your own perceptions as a human, because we, we are trained in a certain way, we see things in a certain way. So I'm just curious, in a way, how, how do you think, how do you think we can go over this kind of limitations that we have as humans? And how, how can we evaluate this kind of results? How can we challenge uh, this kind of perception? And do you think that AI can actually help us go beyond this kind of like preconceived ways of seeing things? Yes, actually, I do. That's what I call the otherness. I think a fundamental question in creation is always that creation is 90% repeating things we've already seen or remember without even, rem you know, just like when you write a text, you know, most of your ideas, they, they don't pop up, you know, like that. Uh, they are actually linked to things you've heard, you've discussed, you've learned, etc. But then we're hoping that there will be a couple of new things that will surge. And that seem initially to come from nowhere because if they're new, they're not a repetition of what once was. So, and, you know, I think with neurosciences, we may one of these days, you know, finally understand some of the mechanism at work in what we call sometimes invention, but we're not yet there. And I think we can definitely use machines for that. But we have to define, and this is why I do think that it revolves much more than what one usually posits around conversation. You know, conversation, there are rules. You know, for example, you know, a conversation presupposes that you have a language in common with a person or whatever. So it means that what kind of language do we want to talk with machines? As I say, you know, who knows? Machine may very well, you feed all the Baroque church and the machine, for whatever reason, you know, doesn't have a category called cupola. She thinks, you know, despite the fact that there are thousands and thousands of cupola in Baroque churches, doesn't read the stuff like that. So it may lead to surprising things, provided we don't impose on the machine to follow too much the way we see things. So we have in some ways to define rules of engagement that enables the machine sometimes to diverge, not too much because then we cannot talk at all with a machine. But if the machine is too constrained, it's going to behave like a bad Baroque designer, very probably. So, so we have, and, and that's why I do think that for me, it came also by reflecting a little bit why Negroponte went from the architectural machine group, which was very, you know, uh, ancestor of AI oriented to interface. And I think because you sooner or later ha find this obstacle of what kind of conversation can you have with a machine? So uh, that do you would think, be my... Just to follow yes. up on this, do you think that also, because of what I'm looking personally at is that Yes, if you have interpolations or if you look through history, actually, you always have this kind of moment in society where you have this kind of invention, yeah? And uh, that's a breakthrough, like all the norms are, are broken and suddenly you end up, let's say, with the iPhone, yeah? Something that we never thought of, perhaps, yeah? It's something completely new. And then suddenly we go in another phase of interpolation. And if you're looking at the past uh, years, we are mostly just iterating within a sort of idea concept of what a smartphone is, yeah? but we didn't invent something completely new outside of that kind of idea of iPhone right now. So in creative processes, personally, I'm looking at this kind of aspects of what's the role of interaction, the interaction between humans and machines, yeah? Because if I'm just, if the interaction is limited to uh, the designer creating a sort of data set, then mostly a machine is just going to output uh, creative uh, 
uh, work or mm -hmm. samples based on the data set. But once I start to, uh, to have a sort of interesting uh, uh, collaboration or interaction, like in certain parts, I have ways to go into the process and interact with that process and then have the AI in a way change perhaps its, its way of seeing things, then personally, my assumption will be that that will lead to something that is going outside of just a data set iteration or uh, interpolation. Uh, how do you see in a way this kind of like uh, aspects of the creative process and how, uh, what will be a, a, an interesting or very, uh, very uh, fruitful in a way, way of setting up a creative process when working with AI? You've described precisely one of the way you could do that, which is in a way entering the black box and beginning to play with what the, the cogs and gears in the black box. Uh, that's a possibility. Another one is the one I evoke, which are glitches. You work at the fringe and you perturbate at the fringe what is produced. That's another way, probably. I think you can probably identify there are probably four or five strategies that you can develop. One, yours is, you know, tempering, entering the black box and tempering with the stuff to see what it gives, which is a little bit like a, you know, a kind of extreme music play, uh, you know, music instrument player trying, you know, to figure out, you know, what if I uh, add a string to the guitar or do this or that, punch a hole, etc. which is one solution. Another solution may be to play, as I say, more at the fringe of the system. There may be other things, for example, going back to the conversation, how does a new ID come to a group? Which, you know, architecture is mostly produced by groups these days. You know, there are teams in big practices and they're doing, uh, you know, whatever they have to produce and, you know, they're brainstorming, etc. And now and then a new ID pops. And, and which raises a number of questions. How do we recognize that it's a super good idea? And what is, and usually a super good idea reorganizes the field around it. So what are these reorganization things? And we're back to a kind of more social because not everything is invented. Uh, you know, there are things that are invented socially, others, etc. So, uh, so that would be as for necessarily as an historian, I'm probably more eclectic in, uh, you know, because I see always a diversity of cases, but yeah, definitely yours is worth exploring. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're muted, Wilda. We have reached the end of our official time. We did have a number of other questions, which I think is a testament to how interesting and relevant your lecture was today. Um, hopefully, maybe students who maybe entered the room late can watch the recording or maybe re-watch it and they can find some answers or continue the dialogue with your own faculty members or read Antoine's books, which are all available um, for sale. Um, and so I want to thank again, thank you Antoine so much for your wonderful lecture and for your incisive comments. Uh, and um, yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you for your invitation again. It has been a true pleasure. Merci, au revoir. Bon revoir. Thank you very much. Thank you.